Okay, let's start. Uh, welcome again. And uh, this is um, SN Applied Sciences webinar, and my name is Nastar Ranjbar. I am the managing editor of uh, the journal. Uh, before I introduce the speaker and uh, start, and he, he will start his uh, his talk, I just wanted to give you a short introduction about SN Applied Sciences. Um, as an Applied Sciences is a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary journal, uh, which actually bridges different fields of natural sciences and engineering together and provide a platform for the scientists who work uh, in different fields of science and need to publish in a multidisciplinary journal. Our journal is fully open access since uh, January uh, this year. And uh, we published more than 4,000 uh, articles. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. James Hindley. Uh, he is one of our authors. He was a selected uh, student among um, a large number of students from different universities in UK. He is doing his research in uh, Imperial College uh, of London. Uh, and he will us. Let me see if I can switch to the next slide. Ah, oh, yes, sorry. Okay, it looks I have a, okay, here. Yeah. Uh, so, and today he will give a talk on membrane functionalization in artific artificial cell engineering. Uh, I'm sure that he will introduce himself and his research better, but I just, before I hand over the word to him, I would like to ask you to keep your cameras off, to make sure that we will have a good connection. And also if uh, at the end for, um, for your questions, you can just write your questions in chat box and I will read it. And of course, if it was necessary to open a discussion, it's possible that you will also talk. So James, uh, it's your turn, so I will stop sharing uh, my, yes, now you can Great. share your slides. Okay, I'll share now. One second. Okay. Hopefully you can see yes. uh, the presentation. Okay, yes. that's great. All right, so thanks for the introduction, Nastaran. And um, <laughs> it's great to be here with you all today, virtually, for <laughs> as one of these um, SN Applied Sciences webinar series. And um, I'm like uh, Nastaran just said, I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about um, a recent mini review that we published in the journal. Uh, and this really focuses on how we can functionalize lipid membranes in the context of building artificial cells. But a little bit about um, Imperial College London first. Um, Imperial College has, you know, is, is one of the sort of premier research universities in the UK. It's the only UK university to focus exclusively um, on science and technology, and now more recently business. And Imperial is really kind of spread across nine campuses across central London, and uh, one of our campuses further out as well. Uh, one second. That's interesting. And so the chemistry department, which I'm uh, part of, I'm now department fellow, has historically been based in South Kensington. Um, but more recently, um, we've uh, moved to a new campus over in White City, which is in just in West London. And we can see the White City campus now and my screen is doing this again. I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna just share the, I think it's because I'm sharing one of my screens, apologies for this. I will share in a second again. Let's do that. Hopefully we won't have any interruptions. So we're now based in White City in the Molecular Sciences Research Hub. This is 180 million pound uh, new building um, which we managed to move into about a year before the current COVID crisis. Um, and it's quite simply a fantastic new building that brings us closer to different communities in the medical sciences. 
Um, the White City campus is close to Hammersmith Hospital, which allows this. Um, I assume that you, you, sorry, you can see that my presentation keeps stopping. <laughs> I'm really sorry oh, about this. Um, I don't know why it's doing this. I'll try once more. Um, and so we're based in uh, the White City campus, and this brings us close to the medical community at House of Hospital, and also to the biotechnology hub, which is developing in the local area of White City. And this is particularly useful for our research when we're building artificial cells in the membrane biophysics platform, as we really want to be intimately connected with not just uh, biophysics, but chemistry, biology, and medicine. So a little bit of an overview of what I'm going to talk about today in the webinar. First of all, what is synthetic biology? Secondly, how can we manipulate soft matter? How can we take lipids and control their self-assembly across length scales? How do we then embed sort of function into these very simple chemical systems? And how do we mix and match these kind of functionalizations of membranes um, to create behaviors that are reminiscent of biological systems? So firstly, what is synthetic biology? There are many definitions for synthetic biology, but I put one on screen that I particularly like, which is that really this is trying to apply engineering principles to biology. This, so hopefully we can understand our natural world better, and this will allow us to actually design or redesign components and systems that don't already exist. And so this isn't just a drive to understand the world around us, but actually it's really to then exploit our understanding to solve global societal problems and challenges. You know, synthetic biology has already led to new advances in cancer immunity immunotherapy on one hand, and then the ability to use cells as biofactories to take, you know, chemical feedstocks that are waste and are pretty much useless and turn them into fine chemicals um, through the machinery of the cell. And so this really is both fundamental and applied science. And one of the key objectives of synthetic biology is to try and find out what is the minimal cell. And by this, I mean, what's the set of information that we can put combined together that will create something that we understand as being alive? And I'm talking about very simple microorganisms. These are single cell organisms. And there's really two ways that we can go about this. The first is using a top-down approach where we take our existing living systems and we genetically engineer them. We can strip genes out and then we see what are the set of genes left over, the, the minimum set of genes that gives us an alive cell. But we can also take a so-called bottom-up approach, and this is what I'm gonna focus on mostly today, where we take the molecular building blocks of cells. So I'm talking about DNA, proteins, lipids, but it could also be completely synthetic chemicals. And we see what's the, the simplest way that we can combine these, where we get interesting lifelike functions and can we make that switch from a self-assembled chemical system to something that we see as biology or something that we see as alive? Now, you may think, why do we want this second approach when we can already work with existing organisms? And really that comes down to trying to deconstruct biological complexity. We can look at different um, networks to illustrate this. So on one hand, we have the Greater Tokyo Railway Network. Now this is pretty complex as anyone trying to get around Tokyo, a rush hour would attest to. But, and, and also if we, if we take out a single station in this network, if we completely cut it out, it'd be hard to predict how this will affect the flow of passengers around the rest of the railway network. So this is a complex system, it's, it's hard to understand. And this is much simpler than the cellular metabolic networks that occur in each of our cells all the time. So I'm showing you just a snapshot of a much larger system of chemical reactions on the right. And we have the same problem. If we try and take out a single pathway from a cell, it's hard to predict how the cell will respond. And it's also hard to figure out exactly what our action has done. So if we're trying to understand a single pathway or a set of pathways, if we're looking at them in the context of a living system, it can be really hard to decouple their function from the rest of the cell. 
And so if we can actually take these pathways, these proteins out and isolate them and then put them in a controlled environment, we can understand them better. And so we can try and engineer biology in a more controllable way. And so this is really what artificial cells are trying to do. We're trying to take some of the components that you see on the left in a real cell, and we're trying to make functional equivalents of them. This often means that we're actually taking these components out of the cell, such as DNA, enzymes, proteins, and bringing them together in new ways. But really, this is a kind of a design or material agnostic approach. Synthetic or artificial cells have been created using, you know, uh, not using just a completely synthetic system, so not using biology at all. But it is often used as it's such a sort of source of inspiration to us in the field. So we can take these components out and try and combine them uh, in interesting ways, in ways that you cannot do in nature. But you know, a big challenge here is, can we actually generate complex behaviors using very small numbers of molecules? And hopefully, I'm going to show you that we can create interesting behaviors here today. And by these behaviors, I'm really talking about things like replication, motility, communication. And by communication, I mean cells talking to one another, but also cells uh, reacting and interpreting their local environment and chemicals in that environment. And then finally, can we create artificial systems that can actually adapt just like living systems do? Could they even evolve? Well, these four behaviors have each been generated in, albeit in simple systems in bottom-up synthetic biology. And today I'm going to highlight two main, two main behaviors um, and show you how membrane functionalization can lead to simple replication and communication behaviors in synthetic cells. So how do we make, uh, I should say, when I, uh, if I use, use synthetic or artificial cell, they're often quite synonymous so that they're, they're used um, by the field. Um, the same thing. So how do we go about actually building an artificial cell? Well, it, many labs utilize uh, the building bricks of the cell membrane itself. And these are uh, really known as phospholipids. So it's one of the most common lipids used by nature. And key to a phospholipid is this dual nature of the molecule. So you have a hydrophobic part, which contains, this is basically long chain hydrocarbons, and it's connected to a hydrophilic head group. And so they're going to self assemble to try and avoid the hydrophobic tails interacting with the water solvent. And this can form a large variety of lipid mesophases. And one of the most sort of famous and useful when we're thinking about building artificial cells is the bilayer vesicle. And we can see a molecular cartoon of this here, where the membrane, a bilayer membrane, will self-assembled to form a 3D sphere, and this encapsulates a encapsulate cargo inside this water core or inside the fatty hydrophobic part of the membrane itself. And vesicles got their first use in applied science um, as drug delivery systems, where we're trying to encapsulate drugs in these spaces and then deliver the drugs to a part of the body using the vesicle. And this is just a cryo uh, electron microscope image of a single vesicle around 100 nanometers in diameter. And these really are very small structures. But as we go towards the microscale, we start to build things that we would recognize more as resembling cells. Um, and really the last 20 years has been spent trying to develop increasingly, increasingly fine control over the vesicle size, uh, composition, uh, the number of bilayers or the number of compartments and how these compartments interact. And we can now produce vesicles all the way to, to 100 micrometers or larger. And we can control, like I said, the number of compartments. And this image here just highlights that we can, with high control, we can create compartments with you know, high connectivity, defined connectivity. And in this case, we're just localizing the expression of a protein to a single compartment in a three compartment vesicle. So there are two main methods I'm going to highlight today about how to produce giant vesicles as a sort of the chassis of potential cells. 
The first is electroformation. And this involves taking a multi lamella lipid film. So this is a dry film of effectively stacks of bilayers. And if we hydrate this in between two um, conducting glass slides, if we apply an alternating current across these, we can get individual uh, bilayers to bud off and to form unilamella giant vesicles anywhere between kind of one to 25 or 50 microns in diameter. And we can make these with a variety of lipids and we can integrate proteins into them. So these become a pretty good artificial cell model. And these are widely used in uh, lipid biophysics to understand the interaction of different lipids with the, in the membrane. But a second technique, emulsion phase transfer, has really become the most widely used method to create artificial cells. And this is because of the encapsulation properties, which I'll talk about more in a second. Emulsion phase transfer works by taking water droplets and placing them in an oil solution. And if we emulsify them, stabilizing each of these droplets with a lipid monolayer, we can then create these micro compartments with a defined uh, aqueous composition. If we take this emulsion and place it on top of a second aqueous solution, we form a second oil water interface. And by driving these droplets across this interface, we can form giant vesicles. We turn this lipid monolayer stabilized droplet into a bilayer stabilized vesicle. And we can compare these methods. They're both great at making vesicles, but there are you know, key differences. And like I said, the ones I, want, the ones I want to highlight really are the encapsulation ability and the scalability of these techniques. So emulsion phase transfer, whatever cargo you are emulsifying in the aqueous phase is going to transfer into your final vesicle. We can stabilize these water and oil droplets. And then again, we take them across the second interface and this generates our final vesicles. So not only does this allow us to increase the throughput of uh, vesicle production, which is great for any kind of translation of these systems, but it also kind of increases the engineerability of them. We decrease the dispersity of the produced vesicles because it's really the droplet size is defined by the channel diameter. And so this way we're getting closer to a, I would say the translation of these sort of very, uh, well, these proof of principle technologies to more product based, uh, well, to products that we could apply in different fields. We can then take variations of this chip design and actually encapsulate different types of droplets, which result in different numbers and compositions of compartments in the end vesicle. And this leads to more complex cell models that are being used now in interesting proof of principle studies. So I've briefly highlighted how we can make uh, vesicles as sort of the chassis of an artificial cell, but how do we actually embed function in them? Well, there's a variety of ways we can functionalize lipid membranes. And this just highlights some of them here. You know, we could use uh, photochemical functional groups. We could add nano, nanoparticles to the membranes. There's a host of different ways, but I like to think of it as either using chemistry, as in using functional groups, using the design rules that we understand from membrane biophysics, or taking elements of biology, and more recently, even elements of nanotechnology and combining it into this, uh, onto or inside our synthetic membranes. And when, if we're thinking about creating artificial cells that can respond to different stimuli, well, we can group those into two different ways. So we could use a local stimuli, such as the pH of a solution or the presence of enzymes. And if we create artificial cells that are designed to respond to, say, a particular enzyme, we're really starting to create systems that will be behave autonomously. So they'll be able to respond on their own, regardless of who is there, or what is, you know, regardless of the user. But if we want to have a really high spatiotemporal control of the artificial cell in terms of activating its function, we really want to design a system with an external stimulus in mind. By that, I mean using light or using a magnetic field. And this will give us that high spatiotemporal control. Um, and then finally, can we make this process reversible? So. Vesicles, I've said, were used, they're often used in drug delivery, but often this is like a single burst effect. So we want 
in artificial cell design to not just create a system that will be activated once, but to create systems that can be activated multiple times. Not only does this make it more lifelike, but it's going to increase the functional lifetime of whatever we're making, which is much more useful when we're considering application. And so we can use chemistry to do this. One example is we can actually create lipids. These are totally synthetic, which contain porphyrin functional groups embedded in the membrane core. These functional groups can then respond to near infrared light and heat the local membrane. So we get a transient permeabilization of the B score membrane, which we can use to drive cargo release, as shown here. I think you can see that this kind of system is going to be ideal, but not in not just in terms of multiple activation bursts, but also using near infrared light, which can actually penetrate uh, the skin, means that we could potentially use this in a, uh, in a these are non toxic and could be used in a biological context in to create artificial cells that can respond to light. Just kind of power through. <laughs> Secondly, we can also actually embed catalysts in the vesicle membrane itself. So in this case, we can design amphiphilic acidic catalysts. And if we place them in the membrane and then add a precursor uh, compound to solution, as in here, well, this catalyst can convert V star to a membrane forming molecule V. And this will effectively create excess membrane area which leads to the division or the self-reproduction of vesicles. What was particularly nice about this application or this paper is that the authors also combined the reproduction of a vesicle with the reprodu uh, reproduction of the genetic uh, information as well through polymerase chain reaction. Secondly, we can use our understanding of membrane organization. So taking a three component lipid membrane we can actually exploit the mixing of different lipids to create vesicles that respond to specific temperatures. So by incorporating an increasing amount of cholesterol in a membrane of DOPC and DPPC, we get interesting phase separation. And as we increase the cholesterol, we get different types of phase behavior. And ultimately, we form just a single phase. So all the lipids mix when we have enough cholesterol. We can take uh, vesicles that possess phase separation and by heating them up we can actually turn them from phase separated into a single mixed phase and then back again and this temperature is defined not only by the lipids we used but the ratio of these lipids in the membrane and this was then shown to uh, function not only so not only can we understand biophysics using this but we can actually use these sort of mixing and demixing cycles to release cargo across the membrane, where in this case, just illustrating this by using a laser to heat a single vesicle to a mixed single phase, as the vesicle cools and phase separation occurs in the membrane, uh, you, this is also accompanied by cargo release of small dyes. And this process is, this relies completely on the presence of domains in the membrane. If we have a single component system, this doesn't happen at all. And so this, again, this is just lipid mediated now. We're not using proteins or even any novel chemistry. Finally, we can use take proteins out of their natural context, as I said at the start. One example is taking mechanosensitive protein channels. These are found across nature, but if we take um, the kind of sensitive channel of large conductance from E. coli, this has been used in bottom-up synthetic biology to create osmotically responsive vesicles. And this channel functions, so when, when there's, there's a, a large osmotic stress on a vesicle and the vesicle is about to burst, this um, channel can open and allow the passage of, molecular, of molecules across, and this allows the vesicle or cell to survive this event. And the Noiro lab just showed in this, uh, in this research that if, they if we take vesicles uh, containing MSCL and expose them to an osmotic stress, the MSCL channel can open and a small sugar can basically permeate the vesicle and this can actually activate the production of another protein, a GFP, which we can then look at with fluorescence microscopy. We can also use uh, transiently associating membrane complexes. So the MIN system is actually 
found in um, bacterial cells and it's really critical to the division of, of bacterial cells. It helps them figure out where the midpoint of the cell is. And so if we take uh, these min proteins and we put them into a vesicle based system, we can generate pulsing behavior where min D will bind to the membrane in the presence of ATP. And then min E can bind and basically uh, hydrolyze ATP. And this allows release of the entire complex. This can actually lead to this interesting pulsing phenotype where the vesicles will actually pulse in fluorescence. And you can actually see this also results in a pulsing of the membrane as well. And so not only can we use these systems to understand, uh, not only can you use these systems to create these interesting behaviors, but this helps us understand biology because it's external to the context of the cell. Finally, we can create photoresponsive um, um, vesicles or organelles, and we can use these to actually generate energy, generate ATP, which is really the unit of energy in biology. And this really lovely example by Lee et al, they used two different photoresponsive membrane channels, and they used, uh, in this case, red light could activate one channel, photosystem two, which generates protons through water splitting. And this proton gradient can then activate an ATP synthase protein, which leads to the production of ATP. However, if they shone green light on these vesicles instead of red light, any protons that have been previously generated were then pumped out of the vesicle. And so we lose this proton gradient, which is critical for the functioning of the ATP synthase. So we can not just, so in this case, we have optical control of, uh, of, the, of the organelle and we can create energy with it, but what can we then do with that? Well, really this then comes down to this plug and play approach, which I wanna briefly cover now. I'm sorry if I go over a little bit for time with all the issues we've been having. So we can take these elements, we can think of proteins or chemistry, uh, chemical functional groups as individual parts that make up a artificial cell device. If we take certain proteins, well, they're effectively gonna, many of them will act as sensors I've already covered MSCL, but then bacteria rhodopsin is another light responsive protein that can sense the rigidity of a membrane or the curvature of a membrane. So if we combine sensors with effector molecules, for example, um, MSCL can sense tension or asymmetry with a molecule that can generate this asymmetry, we can start to build up uh, defined protein interactions. So in this case, we, as I said, we take phospholipase and this, the activity of this enzyme is to actually cut lipid tails and to generate this asymmetry in the membrane. And it's gonna communicate with MSCL through the lipid membrane. And so we can illustrate this with this video here where we take vesicles containing MSCL. And so the channel is embedded in the membrane and it's closed. And in our vesicle, we can put whatever cargo we want. In this case, it's a small dye. If we then add phospholipase to the external solution, it can bind to the membrane and it will cut lipid tails only in this outer uh, monolayer of the membrane. And as it does so, it will change the membrane properties. It generates a lysophospholipid asymmetry and MSCL can sense this lysophospholipid that's only present in one leaflet it activates and we can get cargo release. So this could be used potentially for drug delivery, but what we were interested in is actually embedding this into an artificial cell. So we, want, we embedded this into a giant vesicle and key to this process was actually controlling the enzyme activity. Phospholipases are calcium dependent. And so by using chelators, we could prevent uh, enzyme activity at, in the artificial cell. We could then reintroduce calcium from the external environment by porating our external membrane. And we just use a protein called alpha hemolysin, which acts as like a, a hole punch in a membrane. Once it's formed, it's, it's just forming this constant pore. And so calcium can permeate, it can activate our phospholipase enzyme. And this can then, through this communication process I just defined, activate the MSCL channel. And we get triggered release into the main compartment of the vesicle which we demonstrated using fluorescence microscopy 
and where this dye, as it dilutes, it becomes more fluorescent. And critically, each of these member, uh, protein components was necessary to get vesicle fluorescence. Another pathway that's been recently developed um, uses these photosynthetic organelles I just mentioned. So again, taking these organelles and placing them into a micro container, into a giant vesicle, we can then exploit using red or green light to effectively generate ATP. Um, but then critically, what the authors did is to actually couple this ATP synthesis uh, to an output. In this case, they generated a actin cytoskeleton in the artificial cell, as this actin polymerization is ATP dependent. And you can just see here one, ex one picture showing one of the final networks that were generated uh, with actin in white, the organelles in green, and the outer membrane in red. I would like to say, you know, this is just one use of ATP, but really this work I think is going to be very influential in the design of new sort of artificial bio batteries. A related piece of work, which actually is even more impressive and more ambitious, is this um, artificial photosynthetic system developed by the Herb Group, where they took thylakoid membranes, which are found in nature, and these, these can actually convert um, light to ATP. So we're taking an entire organelle now and encapsulating these into micro droplets alongside this synthetic pathway. And this is not found in nature. And what was particularly interesting about this is we can use a natural organelle to drive a synthetic pathway. So we're really coupling the natural with the synthetic. And actually, in this case, create a micro droplets that could have photosynthetic efficiencies that were greater than found in, uh, in plants. And so I'd like to stop there um, and just conclude with you know, a couple of take home messages. First of all is that you know, we can use bottom up synthetic biology. And really what we're trying to do here is we're trying to reproduce biological behaviors with the smallest set of molecular components that we can assemble. We can manipulate uh, lipid self-assembly across length scales now. We can control the size of vesicles, the compartment number, and how they connect. And in, crucially, we can then combine these frameworks with chemical functional groups, with our understanding of physical design, and with elements of biochemistry and even nanotechnology to, to make responsive vesicles that critically, by mixing and matching these motifs, we can build pathways that you simply cannot build in a living system. This especially applies to trying to integrate, for example, elements of nanotechnology with um, elements of biochemistry. And so I'd just like to thank the Membrane Biophysics Platform um, and the Bevan Labs at Imperial College um, and any of you who have stuck with me through this interesting and slightly uh, chaotic presentation. Um, to thank you for, for staying with me. And um, I'm, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thanks a lot, James. That was very nice and uh, illustrative, actually. Uh, so if there are any questions, you can just write, type it in the chat box so I can uh, read them loudly. But just to start, um, so, can you refer to any concrete medical application of these artificial cells? Like, because yep. you're also talking about genetic engineering. So just some, some examples. Yeah, so artificial cells or kind of bottom-up synthetic biology um, is a bit newer than the genetic engineering approach. So genetic engineering, we're already seeing things coming into the clinic, like I said, in terms of with cancer immunotherapies, uh, with CAR T cells. But as, as today, I wouldn't say there are any artificial cells that are in the clinic. There are, however, you know, proof of principle kind of papers coming out that artificial cells, um, they're being developed to be more robust. So they could be placed in biological environments. And I think we're starting to see a transition from understanding how they work to being applied. Uh, one, one recent paper showed that, you know, artificial cells could actually be used to help um, differentiate neural cells in vivo, for example, uh, sorry, not in vivo, in vitro. And so, yeah, we're really trying to understand exactly how they work. But I think in the next sort of five to 10 years, you will start to see um, either as potentially as therapeutics, but maybe also as diagnostics, these types of technologies come, yeah, come into 
the clinic. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then I have another question here. So you you have discussed about the stability of these cells, which are of course when when you're looking for the applications, it's important. So, um, can you give uh, like a time how stable they are, like yep. about minutes, hours, days, like like a, something which is understandable, really? Yeah, of course. So, it you know it's if you take a very simple systems. Um, they will be stable for a couple of days, at, for example, at room temperature, but this is just in, you know, simple buffers. But what we can do is we can actually, especially if we're working with lipids, we can take some of the techniques that have been used to make um, sort of liposome or vesicle technologies from drug delivery. We take the same things that make them stable. So, for example, putting cholesterol in the membrane. Uh, actually putting uh, pegylated lipids. So lipids that will effectively shield the membrane from the local biological environment. We can use them and these have been utilized recently in some of the papers I mentioned. And this allows the cells to become stable for at least a couple of days, uh, you know, in cell culture serum and things like this. So we can, pr we can increase the robustness of these, um, yeah, to serum components. Um, I would say at the moment, I think a couple of days in vitro, in vivo, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I think there's a ways off before we do that. But yeah, I would say a couple of days in complex biological fluid. Okay. okay. So I have another question. Uh, just let me, if I can. Um, the question is that uh, does the artificial cell um, or can the artificial cell mimic the normal cell cell function? Yeah, that's a, it's that's a really good question. I mean, uh, I think you know the aim of of bottom up synthetic biology is to create what let's say a single organism that could actually it can move around and it can divide and it can you know it can do everything. Um, what we're doing at the moment is trying to recreate single functions or single behaviors so the ones that i talked about today really focused on uh, sort of reproduction of the vesicle or the ability of the vesicle to in a simple way to sense its environment so in the example i showed either to sense the calcium concentration in its local environment so in this respect yes artificial cells can in a simple way <laughs> um, mimic the functions of of living systems but really the challenge is to make these systems robust and to integrate behaviors. And this is what I think will be really challenging, but you know, exciting moving forward. Okay, great. And uh, another question. Uh, so you have mentioned different pathways, actually, that they were different. And um, which of these pathways are more common or um, are used at the moment? Is there any difference or they are just um, growing in, in a parallel way? So in terms of what's been developed i would say the um the photosynthetic um vesicles the ones that can basically take light and turn that into atp um i think we're going to see the most kind of use of this purely because as i said it you know if we want to have artificial cells that can power themselves they're going to need energy and this is just a really great way to you know just use the light you know, to actually, yeah, just use in this case red light or white light um, to power um, whatever function you want. Um, I mean, we're working on the, the mechanosensitive channel pathway that I mentioned. We're trying to make that more specific and to have interesting kind of outputs from that. We have the core of a pathway there, but now it's again, it's about using it to do something that's particularly interesting or useful. Okay, perfect. I don't see any further questions, so um, I think, um, yeah, there are not any, uh, just a second. Nope. Uh, explain more about how microfluidics microfluid can produce asymmetric uh, yeah. vesicles. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, this kind of comes down to the, the, the mechanism of phase transfer as a whole. So in phase transfer, um, I should have kept my screen share gone, but I, I will just uh, describe it. You know, we, we can stabilize these aqueous droplets with a lipid monolayer. 
And so we can actually put those lipids into the water droplets. And this will allow us to basically have, like I said, a single monolayer. And we define the, the composition of that monolayer by placing that in water. We can then place a second type of lipid in the, in the oil. And so this way we can control through the amounts of lipids and the, but through the type of lipids and the concentrations, we can effectively specify the content of monolayer A, and then secondly, the content of monolayer B. So we can do this in a test tube, or we, and we can then just do that on a microfluidic chip. So this way we can basically build up a, an asymmetry across the membrane. Um, and this asymmetry um, is pretty much, as far as I understand, impossible to generate using electroformation or any other method, because any other method of building a vesicle, you're not building it up individual monolayers, you're just, you have the lipids, they form a bilayer straight away. Um, and this asymmetry is actually found throughout biology, and it's going to, I think it's going to be particularly important in building lifelike artificial cells. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. So I'm sure that the participants will probably contact you for more questions yeah. or any collaboration interest or uh, further issues. Okay, thanks again, James, uh, for this fantastic um, talk. And thanks all the participants um, and hope to see you again in the next uh, webinar of SN Applied Sciences. Thank you. Have thanks a nice day and have a nice week. <laughs> thanks everyone, bye. Bye.